this is not a technical talk. The subject I'm talking about is not technical. It's social, ethical, and political. The issue is, what should the rules of society be for using software? Most of the time when people raise this question, they work for software companies. So they raise it in a self-serving way. They ask, what rules can we impose on everyone else to make them pay us a lot of money? I'm sure you're familiar with the answer they get. I had the good fortune in the 70s to be part of a community of programmers who shared software. And because of that experience, I was able to look at this question from a different direction, to ask, what rules make for a good society that's good for everyone to live in? So I reached a completely different answer, and that answer is the basis of the free software movement. But I should start by saying a little bit about this community. It included programmers at some of the best universities, and even programmers in computer companies sometimes participated. And sh sharing our software was our way of life. It, if anyone ever refused to share, it was weird and strange, but it hardly ever happened. The lab where I worked was, in a way, the deepest central part of this community because in that lab, all the software we used was the community's software because the programmers in our lab, the artificial intelligence lab at MIT, programmers who called themselves hackers, had developed a time-sharing system themselves, and I joined that team when I began working there. To be a hacker meant to enjoy the spirit of playful cleverness. So when these people were doing their job developing the time-sharing system, they were also having fun employing their intelligence cleverly. So that, that enjoyment is what they meant when they said that they were hackers, when we said that we were hackers. So in this community, we were completely living in freedom. All the software that we used, we had the source code for. We could study it, we could change it. We were, if you asked for a copy, we were delighted that you were interested. Of course, we were glad to give you a copy. In this community, if you walked past another hacker's screen and saw something strange, different, you'd say, hey, what's that? And he'd say, oh, that's the new FUBAR program that we just got from Stanford, and it's in the FUBAR directory. So at that point, you could go to the FUBAR directory, and you'd see the executable that you could run, and also the source code, which you could read and study to learn how they solved those problems. If you used the program, you'd probably occasionally run into bugs and you might have ideas for new features or different features. So you could go to the source code and fix the bugs and add more features. You could make any change you could think of. People would sometimes tell you, please make your own copy and change that. And you could also cut a piece of it out and put it into some other program that you were working on. We called that cannibalizing the old program, which was a joke because when you cannibalize a machine for spare parts, that machine doesn't work anymore. But when you cannibalize a program, you're copying part of it, so it's not broken, it still runs just the same. <clears throat> so you could use this FUBAR program, not just by running it, but in all the various ways it might potentially be useful. You could study it, you could change it, you could adapt it, you could learn from it and copy from it. So the software developed in our community was part of human knowledge. The incompatible time-sharing system that we used was part of human knowledge, available to anyone who wanted to learn from it. And because of that, I was able to feel very proud of the work I was doing. I was not merely helping one group of people beat out another group of people. I was working for everyone. I was on everybody's side. And that's something that I can feel very proud of doing. <clears throat> However, eventually we got a taste of what life was like for most computer users. The ones who were not part of a community like ours. 
This happened when Xerox gave MIT a laser printer. This laser printer was a handsome gift because it was the first time anyone outside Xerox ever had a laser printer. It was the first generation. It was actually a high-speed office copier that had been modified internally to turn it into a printer. In some ways, it was very good. It printed a page a second. It had high resolution. Straight lines came out sharp and straight. But it also got frequent paper jams. As a copier, there would have been, it would have had somebody standing nearby. So when it got jammed, the person would have fixed it. But as a printer, it was off by itself. Often, nobody went there for an hour, and it could stay jammed for an hour. It was a substantial practical problem. And as soon as we recognized that this was a frequent problem, we had an idea for how to solve it. We thought we could use the same method that we used for the previous printer, the old printer, that was slow and low resolution and tended to make straight lines come out a bit wavy and also got paper jams. Since we were programmers, not printer designers, we couldn't make that printer any faster or any higher resolution or make it not get paper jams. But we were able to change the software that ran the printer to compensate for the paper jams, at least. You see, I added a feature to the program that controlled the printer so that every time the printer got jammed, the system displayed a message on the screen for those users who were waiting for printing right then saying the printer is jammed go fix it now if you got that message you were not going to take the risk of assuming someone else would fix it because you knew that only a few people were waiting for printing and only those people were getting the message so you would go to the printer right away as a result although the printer still jammed occasionally a minute later two or three people would come and fix it in effect we treated the user as part of the system, and we added end-to-end -end feedback, and we got reliable operation from the system as a whole, even though the printer itself was still unreliable. Well, that was a good solution, so we thought of using it for the new printer. But there we ran into a stone wall. You see, we were able to use this approach for the old printer because it was controlled by a free program, a pr part of the community's software. We had the source code. We could make changes in it to do anything we wanted, limited only by our skill as programmers. But the new printer was controlled by a proprietary Xerox program. We did not have the source code. And that meant that we were completely helpless. Didn't matter how skilled we were. We couldn't do anything to it. We were prisoners of our software. And the result of that was constant frustration. You would type the command to print a file, and then you'd go back to work, because you know it would be foolish to expect it to be printed soon. A while later, you'd notice the time. Oh, it's been half an hour. Well, I can't be, be sure it's been printed yet, and I don't desperately need it, so I'll go back to work. A while later, you'd notice the time. Oh, it's been a whole hour. Ah, maybe it's printed now. So you walk upstairs to the printer and you see it's been jammed the whole time. So you fix it and you go back to work and you say, and a while later you notice the time. Oh, it's been a half hour. Maybe it's printed now. So you walk upstairs to the printer and you see it printed 200 pages of other people's stuff, three and a half minutes for this fast printer, and jammed again. And at that point, you'd say, I'm going to stand here and fix this damn thing every time it jams until I get my output. Constant frustration. It wasn't supposed to work that way, but that's the way it did work. And what made it even more galling was to realize that we could have solved the problem, except that somebody in Xerox was deliberately standing in our way, deliberately keeping us helpless by giving us only the binary of that program. Eventually, I heard that somebody at Carnegie Mellon University had a copy of that source code. 
later on i was in the area so i went to his office